for me personally, today is a beautiful day because we are getting into real chaos. And today has much to do with what was a very young mathematician in the 60s and very charismatic mathematician called Stephen Smale. He's an exquisite mathematician, but he thinks visually. He says formulas hamper understanding. Amusingly enough, that's what he says, but here is what he does. In 1967, he writes a fundamental paper, the paper that changes everything, the paper that now our experimentalists doing fluid dynamics intuitively understand a revolutionary paper. And here is the abstract of the paper. He says, introduction to conjugacy problems for diffeomorphisms. This is a survey article in the area of global analysis defined by a differentiable dynamical systems or equivalent to the action differentiable of a Lie group G on manifold M. Here, diff of M is the group of all diffeomorphisms of M, and a diffeomorphism is a differentiable map with a differentiable inverse. Our problem is to study the global structure, that is to say, all of the orbits of M. So now you're a biophysicist, neuroscientist, uh, a plumber, cardiac dynamics, whatever, you're doing some real thing. There are infinitely many articles that come out in mathematics. You don't understand the title or most of them. How would you know that this is one article you must understand? So I will try to explain what the content of this breakthrough in theory of dynamical systems is. It's an apex of long development from Poincaré through Berkhoff and through Russian school of and also of Alexei, various great mathematicians. Physicists have contributed zero to all of this by the 1960s. And it deals with something very elementary, very important, that is baking. So I will now switch to giving you a lesson in baking. I'm allowed to do this because I'm Danish and Danes are famous bakers. This actually is the content of the paper. We have here, it's not pandemic, but Danish pastry is so greasy that if I don't do this in gloves, I won't be able to clean the laptop ever again. They explained the work of Smale on a science program on Danish television. And for that, I needed a baker. Now, Danish television is a kind of stodgy organization. So there is a guy who always invites his cousin, Baymaster Iverson. Uh, yes, I can stop this for a moment. Well, doesn't matter. Uh, and Baymaster Everson is always invited to children's programs. He lives in a beautiful little town where we send all our tourists to close to the airport. And Baymaster Everson is used to do children's programs where children are learning how to bake. But I wanted to show the work of Smail. So for that, I needed some dough. And I need to make Danish pastry. For people who have not suffered growing up in the United States, you might not know what Danish pastry is. It's an unspeakably ugly thing that's being sold various places. However, in Denmark, Danish pastry is uh, so important in culture that it's called Wienerbrot, means Viennese pastry. So it's much more refined, the Danes itself. And what you do in Danish pastry, you take some dough, which I've here prepared in anticipation of Thanksgiving, and you press it down 
in such a way that the volume of the door is conserved. That's uh, one of the fundamental laws of nature. In such a way that uh, my little bundle of dough becomes one half, that's what I thought, one half as thick and twice as wide after I'm done pressing. Then Danish colors are white and red. So I take jam made by my neighbors from across the street, homemade jam, put a layer of it here. Oops, already a problem. And then I told Bear Mr. Everson, now take this, fold it, and squeeze it down again. And he said to me, what? That's not how we make Danish pastry, what we do. And he just took over, so I never got to explain Smale's fundamental work. We take one third of the pastry, we press it down, we take the other third of the pastry, we press it down, and then we press it in this way, the ends are very pretty. We press it down so we get the third of original volume, and then you know, when you look at it, now this goes on, but when you look at it, you get the beautiful three layer structure, which in my non-professional <laughs> uh, version doesn't look so good as it should. And now what Ben Mr. Riverson does, he keeps doing this. He does it about 12 times. And then he puts it to bake and, you know, the beautiful layers of Danish pastry. Uh, it's red and white. Now, what he doesn't know that if you do it, I forget how many times, but let's say 12, 15 times. We're dealing with exponentials again. The thickness of every layer, if he did a perfect job, would be uh, one angstrom. <laughs> it would be in... Uh, you know, atomic units. And now what happens in practice, before you get to one angstrom, the things get to diffuse, so you don't get the fractal you were hoping to get, but you get something that's arbitrarily thin and has arbitrarily many layers. And now this is not some stupid map that... Uh, Strogatz or somebody else has concocted to be instructive. This is really how the nature works, at least how the baking works. But it turns out the nature works as well this way. So what we did last lecture, contour sets and you know, thinking about nature of infinity and whatnot, it's not some stupid mathematical obsession with things that serious people don't care about. It's something that we have to deal with in nature, every place, all the time. It's most striking in celestial mechanics. You know, celestial mechanics is very repetitive because the planets go this way and the asteroids and asteroid build of this and their rings turn around. And they have infinitely fine structure, and you wonder how this happens. The same way as Bayer, Mester, Everson, what happens for them is that you are doing a simple thing, like you're stretching and then folding something as simple as dough in a very simple, easy to describe manner. So there is nothing fancy about all this. And the result is infinitely complicated. Why is it infinitely complicated? Because you have infinite time, like billions of years in solar systems, to do this boring thing over and over again. And you get these incredibly fine structures. And they're not just mathematical fascinations. They're the real thing. Nature really uses them. The way Smale thought about Danish pastry is 
the simplest example. You thought of it like I say, I take a block of dough and I look at it from the side because I'll be folding it on a straight line. So, you know, the transverse direction is not very important. Then I uh, squish it. So you imagine there is a hand at the top. I squish it. And if I'm very careful, if this was going in my door unit from zero to one, I stop pressing it when I get to the width twice. And when you do a mathematical door, you know, it could be a foamy thing. It's something that actually doesn't have to just be one half. It can be some thickness that's less than one half, let's say thickness A. Or a is some number. Then you say, uh oh, this is off the table. So let me just put a knife here and cut it so it's back on the table. And now there are two options. You know, you can lift this and put it on the top and just lift and put it on the top. So you get something that now has two layers. And, you know, if I had this divided at A and B or uh, white and red or whatever, after stretching, you know, this letter will stretch out by factor of two, but this will stretch out by two. And if I, you know, slide it on top up here, and if it was, uh, A was smaller than one, so I compressed it more than just keeping the volume at one half, then this would actually not go all the way to one half. So it would fill out this much space here and this much space here. And let me delineate it. So we we'll get two volumes. And if I insisted to place this thing to be at one half height, there will be an empty space here. So this is one half. This is A here. And now if I rinse and repeat, you will realize that Next time I do this, you know, this will get stretched out, cut, put on the top, and I would have four of these layers. So what would happen as I kept doing this is I would just get in the X direction, nothing interesting because, you know, everything is uniformly stretched. But in Y direction, I would be getting that counter set The drawing is not good enough, but basically I would get four layers of my Danish pastry and holes in between, emptiness in between. And this goes ad infinitum. And if I just look at the section of it, it's a counter set we discussed last time. So this is one way the baker might make a counter set. Now, there's another way a baker might make a counter set, which is in this step here, what I do is I hinge this area called B. You know, it's cut here, but I just hinge it around here. So, and I raise it over on this hinge and I flip it over and slide it on top. And then I would get something that looks like A, but B would be now upside down. 
So, you know, I just rolled it over instead of lifted it and slid it over. So there are many options of how you can make these things. They're called Baker maps, formulas hamper understanding, but I can write down a few formulas. A master of baking, a baker, not a man called Baker by family name. They're called Baker's maps. And they illustrate this dynamical principle of creating uh, fractal sets by re repetitive motion. Now, as Mayle warned us, uh, formulas hamper understanding, but what we do is, you know, we first get this qualitative understanding what's going on. And then to put it on computer and do calculation, you do actually have to write a formula because computers are not so smart. So here is the same thing said as a formula. I start with my block or door, I'm looking at it from the side. And I squish it. And I cut it. And now after I've cut it to height A, and this is zero, one, two, If I'm on the left hand side of the door, so if X was smaller than one half, so if I was here, then all that happens is this one half moves to one by stretching by factor of two. So the result is uh, still something measured in units x but you know multiplied by two but in y direction i got shrunk by factor a so this is a mathematical formula for the left half of this thing and for the right half you know it ends up being here so it's still multiply by X and squinch by A, but I have to put it back on the table so I can continue kneading. So, you know, you can do any possible thing. For example, you can slide the thing under the top part we place down here by sliding it. So it ends up down here. That's this formula. So if I, if I was in this part, um, on the left or part, so I have to do a little making up, I slide it. And then uh, in the Y direction, I want to center you know, this part has to be uh, brought up. Well, one it means I just put, you know, slide it back, but then I move it by one half and I find out that the other thing is that. Now, these Baker's maps are very useful to developing intuition about dynamical sets because these are linear maps. You know, they're incredibly easy to program. They're incredibly easy to iterate tens, hundreds, thousands times numerically. So they're quite useful to develop intuition. And one of my colleagues, Ed Ott, has written a whole book on chaos, which is all based on intuition you get from Baker's maps. Now, Baker's maps are not really the Danish pastry I showed you. And, you know, nature rarely has these knives 
to cut up state space and you know these slices, etc. Usually, laws of nature, as exemplified by Lorentz or Rosler model, don't have that. Uh, you know what actually happens is that after I stretch here, I don't have a knife, and that's what I did for you by hand. What I do is, as a baker, I take this stretch thing and I fold it back. And then I squish it. So the nature likes to do, and that's a continuous process, you know. Nobody gets separated from their mothers or sisters entire distance around here because you know two neighbors here are very far one step later but here the neighbors remain neighbors and Poincaré sections that we studied of Lorentz and Rosler you know do that they keep things stretched by continuous so this I call stretch and fold and this is the part of the snail's paper that made such an impact once it you know percolated to working people. Because what happens with this stretch and fold is in the next iteration, uh, you know, this thing gets first stretched, so it has to be very thin in this direction. But then the top has to be folded on. And you find out that uh, there is an inner part. This guy ends up on the left hand side. There is an outer part, and your material now it's continuous. You know, nicely smooth every place. But the sheets of the dough are getting thinner and thinner. That's what you want when you're making German strudel or Danish pastry, lots of thin sheets. And uh, the whole thing is still on a baker's table and it's just continuous process that you do. So this is actually what nature likes to do. And it was codified in the simplest possible form, just like we use parabola to describe stretch and fold uh, iteration of unit interval, one dimensional space. Now we're in two dimensions because this is X and Y variable by French theoretical mathematical astronomer, Marcel Enon. H is not pronounced in French. Uh, in a moment, I'll you know, derive it in the sense, but basically it says, you know, when you're looking at two dimensions and you're trying to find something more interesting than the very unphysical Baker's map, you know, this mapping where left side is linear, right side is linear and shifted. Uh, if you're trying to understand how Lorentz attractor or Rosler attractor or other models of physical processes uh, or chemical or biological processes work, the simplest thing that you can end up is a situation where X is stretched by some factor A and um, then the nonlinear process, uh, the simplest one is you, you uh, square the X coordinate. That looks like the parabola, because, but we're in two dimensions. So in the other coordinate, you shrink it just like we did in this illustration. So this par parameter squeezes the uh, y direction and picks up, you know, it cross couples. So this depends on x and this depends on y. Uh, and before I stop with this explicit formula, which you do not understand because I just wrote some stupid formula and you have no idea what does it do and explain 
you know, what is it doing? Let's linearize it immediately because we know that we always need a stability of linear stability of any map. And what happens when we take this matrix is, uh, you know, matrix of dx, i, dx, j, it's two by two matrix. And uh, the new thing that happens now is that because the map is non-linear, when you take one derivative of it, it's I pick up minus two a n. Now this, when I take derivative with respect to the second variable, just gives me one. When I take derivative one with respect to first variable, gives me b. And when I take derivative of the second variable, it doesn't depend, so it's zero. So it's a very simple one-step stability. Now I put here an index n at time n because this depends on the value of uh, your variable x at time n. So this Jacobian is changing as you forward, go forward in time. It has a one very nice property, you know, which was one of the reasons why Enon, who is a very good mathematician, an astronomer chose is that when you take a determinant of this thing, in other words, a measure whether the volume of state space changes in one iteration in time, it turns out that, uh, you know, from here you get zero, from here you get minus b. So this parameter, measures how contracting the flow is. And remember, contraction of a flow in few dimensions is connected to dissipation, to loss of energy. So, you know, if similar neighboring trajectory approach it other, if there is an energy loss uh, due to friction that brings them together. But there's an interesting case which we actually study currently in uh, field theory, not dynamical systems, that if this number is one, then the system is Hamiltonian. That is to say, it's energy preserving. So it's a good thing that often happens when you study mechanical systems. And we care about uh, Hamiltonian systems because quantum mechanics is built from them. You know, we have very good reasons why not to assume that Newton is wrong and uh, celestial motions are forever because for all practical purposes, they are forever in celestial mechanics and they're also forever in quantum mechanics. Now, how did Enon come? To this, he tried to understand the work of a colleague. He works or used to work in this. His colleague still works in Paris, uh, Yves Pomo. And uh, Yves Pomo was trying to understand what is, you know, deep qualitative nature in the sense of Poincaré of Lorentz map. You know, how does Lorentz flow create chaos? And he was doing that by looking at the cross sections. Now, today it's very easy. By that time, it required some numerical skill and access to computers. We are talking probably early seven, mid 70s or something, early 70s. So he thought, you know, can I just write a simple thing that qualitatively captures what Lorentz dynamics does? What he wrote actually turns out to be more similar to Rosler, but it was all part of the same effort to understand qualitative theory of these things. So he said, let me start with some volume centered on the origin. 
of x and y of some state space do a thing on this volume. So take x, but for y, you know, keep y as it is, but add to it one minus minus x square minus a times x square. And let's say that's the next state of the system. Now again, this is a formula, but what it really meant is that if I take this thing and take a parabolic function of coordinate x, that will create a shape whose height will be you know, parabolic in shape. So this rectangle becomes bounded by parabolas on the edges, straight line, you know, go parabolic. But the height of this will depend on A. So if A is very large, and then, you know, I raise it a little bit, so I center it above, that's what this one does. And it says, that explains how door is being stretched. But now, let's uh, look at how door is being squished. And what this does is it takes the shape, if B is smaller than one, X gets shrunk, and this shape, you know, gets thinner. Its height is the same as it used to be, but it gets thinner because it's crunched in this direction. And that's my next state of my system. And then it one says, well, okay, but, you know, I would like this thing to look like my original shape because I would like to repeat this whole thing. So let's do the following thing. Let's flip it across this diagonal. So there is a diagonal here and I'll just flip it. So now it's stretched this way. The way you flip something across the diagonal is you take previous coordinate and what used to be x is now y. And what used to be y before is now x, you know, I just interchange the coordinates. And what I get is this shape in the state space. But now it's turned out sideways. And it really looks like explicit mathematical formula for what Smale had in mind. You know, Smale had in mind the idea that you take door and you bend it. And that does the job. Takes door the bending and you then start repeating it. And Smale felt that this should produce more and more layers for Danish Base three. This is the thing that's parameterized by two numbers. You know, these three things written as one formula give you a known map. So that's where it came from. It doesn't mean anything when I give it to you, but if you understand what it, how it was constructed, you can go to a deserted island and construct it yourself. Now, Enon had access to small computers as well, because astronomers, you know, had to do calculations on computers. So he said, well, you know, let me uh, see what is, you know, okay, I have a formula, but what does it do? And uh, he chose, after some experimentation, 
values of these parameters, totally arbitrary, same as Lorentz model. You know, once you have quality of understanding, you try to choose some parameters that make it easy to understand what you want to do. So this factor of A not being one and not being two and not being larger says that when I, you know, take my thing and I bend it, I don't stretch it all that much. So it's not too stretchy. Now, do you, this you can quantify by looking at fixed points, finding their eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and they give you precise statement, you know, what stretchy means. But uh, morally, that's what it is. A just controls stretching. And B, you know, if you take it too large, uh, it's not very much like a known because a known is very thin. If you take it too thin, you see no structures. So you don't want it to be too squeezy. And indeed, for these parameter values, and this is described well in Strogat's book, so I don't have to do it for you. For these parameter values, when you start with any volume, but it turns out even any point, uh, you will always end up looking at the same picture. And the same picture very coarsely will look like, you know, what we started with. There's something that looks parabolic and then it bends. And if you do what we told you to do, always find fixed points to understand stuff, then it turns out there are two fixed points. You know, it's a quadratic map. So when you take square roots of quadratic maps, you get two solutions. The two fixed points, and they have two eigenvectors each. And there is an eigenvector that goes this way, which is unstable. And then there is an eigenvector that goes this way, and it's stable. And similarly, around this fixed point, there is a in a stable direction, which is this way, unstable direction that goes around. So locally, you know, dynamics follows the rules of linear as dynamic, but globally you have stretching and folding, stretching and folding. And we know in the beginning what it's supposed to look like. You know, it's supposed to, after second application of this map, I should get roughly speaking four folds, eight folds, etc. Turns out not quite, but that's an upper limit on them. And now what happens, it turns out that this thing uh, just keeps doing something. And if you look at it in detail, you know, take an enlargement any place. So if you enlarge any part of it, I don't know, someplace here, let's say, you enlarge it. And now, you know, we know these things because we have been renormalizing in period doubling. You know, it's okay and useful maybe to renormalize, so enlarge. And what you see in that picture, now, you know, this is produced by iteration of single point, but you can iterate until the cows come home. So you will get things that are not points, but look like lines. So you look, you'll see something that looks like that, like that, like that, you know, just enlarged. So it seems to have more layers of Danish pastry. Uh, here is one time where PowerPoint would be more useful than Bologna blackboard or you know, this scribbled paper. If you take a part of this, 
small part of it and enlarge it, you know, blow up that square and look what's in there, it will morally and sometimes also literally look like that. It will be self-similar. More advanced course will study it more detail. There is a precise sense of self-similarity, but for purposes of this, this is self-similar and operation of doing what we are doing here will produce what Mandelbrot likes to call fractal. It's a convenient word, we use it. And the whole object here has gotten a name given by Ruel and Tarkins, has been called strange attractor. Which is cute. It's, kind of, it's attractive. Any point close enough falls into this. And you can quantify that. And calling it strange is okay. But when you try to define it mathematically, it's not so easy to define strangeness. So I'll try to do that in this lecture, but it's a non-trivial problem. And first I want to give you a sense. This seems so simple, uh, stretch, fold, stretch, fold. What could go wrong? More technically, you expect the system to be ergodic in the following sense. Because you had neighbors in this piece of dough, every time you squeeze it, the neighbors go further apart. So they're running away from each other exponentially. But the door is not allowed to leave the room. So while your neighbor has gone away, once the folding happens, you have a new neighbor who used to be very far away from you and is back again. And as you repeat this argument, you realize you know, what I'm interested in is what we call topological entropy before. I'm interested in all possible way that my neighbors, who used to be within a cubic millimeter of me, after some number of iteration, come and revisit this neighborhood. Because as this process go on, all neighbors uh, separate, they go and visit very distant ones. And as you repeat it, you actually have non-zero probability for any finite neighborhood to re-enter the neighborhood. So technically, this is called ergodicity. It was introduced by Boltzmann to explain how is it that deterministic system, such as argon molecules, just hard balls just hitting each other deterministically, how do they create statistical mechanics, you know, mechanics where we have to worry about error of time and things like that. It was very controversial then, but today we have a rather precise sense to understand what is controversial about why ergodicity is not at all trivial assumption, obvious assumption, but a very bold assumption. And known is a beautiful illustration of it. So a strange attractor today technically would mean an ergodic set, meaning that if I started at any open neighborhood, any little rectangle square on this plot, uh, I would return and return infinitely often. It might take a long time. You know, in statistical mechanics, they teach about Poincaré recurrence times. In this, this is a very, you know, low dimensional system, so it's not that long, but. Uh, it uh, might take a long time, but the idea is that anybody who starts out will mix with anybody else who is in this set. Now, when does this fail? Could it fail? Well, if there were an attractive, let's say, periodic orbit or any other subset of the set which is attractive, it would mean I would get started, I would visit this, 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 and then I would find a hole like in a billiard and fall into the pocket of a billiard. 
And once I'm in that other world, I don't come back. So ergodicity is lost. So strange attractor is assumed being ergodic means that we are saying that every neighborhood and every trajectory is hyperbolic, means it's unstable in some directions, stable in other directions. And there are no stable orbits. Is that easy to guarantee? Well, it turns out it's very hard. It's as hard as producing something called integrable systems, which is a world at other end. You know, there are generalizations of harmonic oscillators, which always oscillate. And uh, I know their solutions. They're never uh, chaotic or hyperbolic. So here is the problem. Uh, what we assume in a, this ergodic, chaotic dynamics that we have to stretch neighborhoods. So if we are given a neighborhood upon one Poincaré map return or upon one Baker's action, will get stretched. Then we are not allowed to throw stuff off the table, so it has to be kept. It has to be folded or sliced or something, stretch and fold easily. So it has to do in this. And then it has to be squished. You know, its volume has to decrease. If we are describing dissipative systems such as fluid turbulence or viscous fluids or, or some chemical process like Belushi Shibatinsky or neurodynamic process where we want to have a robust answer, even studies it. And squishing makes this thinner. And here comes the trouble. When I look you know, squishing every place, okay, but when I look at the fold, you know, the neighbors used to be stretched because I stretched the neighborhoods and then I folded them. But when I start squishing them, the things that got stretched by squishing could come close again. So in general, for systems like an on a tractor, I, we do not know where this neighborhood is squished or folded. Uh, in other words, it's possible the neighbors are not going away if they come into the folding thing. And uh, the dangerous regions, if I look at and on and any other such stretch and fold system, you know, the dangerous regions are that I have this unstable manifold where all the neighbors are going away from each other. Then I have stable directions every place because this is hyperbolic flow. So I have directions which are transfers to them, which are called stable. Directions along the unstable one if all everybody is separating, so this is called unstable. And then there is a set of points, but there are infinitely many of them because every time I fold, I double the number of folds. Set of points which in which we do not know. We have to work much harder to see that somebody who is in that neighborhood uh, leaves it by being repelled or actually falls in because the squishing wins out. So it turns out that we have this unknown, which is, you know, stability matrix, which depends on A and B, you know, depends on the position at state that I'm in. And it's quite possible that uh, this B locally is such that this, uh, squishing winds out and I find myself in a hole. 
So it's quite possible. It's a competition between stretching and contraction. And it's quite possible that the terminant of a particular trajectory that visits this neighborhood, a you know, particular orbit to be more precise, orbit P, that is in one of the infinitely many neighborhoods where folding points are, is such that it uh, contracts. And, uh, you know, also the eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, it's a two dimensional system. Every orbit has two eigenvalues, but it's quite possible that if I look at the values of them, they're all smaller than one. What happens then? You know, everything bounces around by ergodicity. Whenever it comes close to this hole, it comes into something we call basin of attraction. And it can fall, fall in and end up being an attractive set, which is a small subset of the whole strange set. In other words, if that happens, it's strange, not strange, but it's just a transient behavior before you end up in a asymptotic behavior, which is maybe cycle of length 274, you know, whatever. Could be arbitrary length, arbitrary small neighborhood. And this was understood rather early, and known is a beautiful example for you to understand. If you're interested in flows in which you don't have any violent cutting up of neighborhoods, so flows that are given by potentials that are polynomials or, you know, continuous functions. And in physics, that's what we almost always need, unless we have some reason to look at some sharp edge, which then we put in by hand. But, you know, typical flows are smooth. Uh, it's almost impossible to show that a smooth flow the one without knives and other weird sharp objects making it, uh, you know, discontinuous. It's almost impossible to show that some place in a state space of all possible initial conditions, there are no what's called islands of stability. There are no neighbors in which you get sucked in and you cannot leave them. And for a non attractor. We do not know to this day whether it's a strange attractor or not. You know, my money is that it's not, but it's a very delicate mathematical issue. Uh, I'm not sure how you even settle it because, you know, you have to exclude that after infinitely many iterations, you still are not in an attracting set for generic initial points. So it's, it hasn't been proven and probably will never be proven. Related results can be proven saying that for uh, you know a fractal set of points, uh, the system is ergodic if you start on the strange attractors, but the complement is not. All kinds of nightmares that you should not worry about because what happens in your life, and on and such maps are just models of what's going on. What's going on is always noisy. So if you had a very small attractor in this state space, in this picture here, the noise, even if it's attracting, but small, the noise will kick you out. So you will never find it, never see it. So we don't have to worry. And if you do quantum mechanics, similar thing happens. The neighborhoods are bounded by Planck constant. So if this classical features are smaller than effective, Black constant for a neighborhood, then uh, they cannot be observed in quantum systems, and so on. So at this point, uh, the problem becomes very serious, and mathematicians can spend the rest of their lives doing it, and they are grateful that they do. But you don't have to worry about it. So. It was a great advance from 
Maxwell Poincaré uh, notion of ergodicity, Boltzmann, of the end of 19th century, the advent of chaos produced systems that didn't have avogadro number of molecules and therefore they looked uh, unpredictable and probabilistic. Systems that had only two or three degrees of freedom, like, you know, Lorentz, where you measure three observables, or uh, Rosslayer, or a known map, which is a, a discrete time analog of these continuous flows. So almost nothing, uh, you know, it's so simple. The only thing, it's nonlinear. <laughs> it's the only thing that happens to it. And it's a wonderful playground for understanding ergodicity, understanding when it fails and what to do when it fails. This seems to be all predicated, and you know, that was a very surprising thing in when it was invented, discovered by Sinai Ruel in 1960s and 70s, that you can have statistical mechanic systems like Boltzmann systems, but they lived their ergodicity was not over all phase space. That's how we think about Boltzmann and also ergodicity celestial systems. It was actually living on small fractal sets. You know, nobody expected this, I believe. And only computer simulations, you know, gave us a good sense. Yeah, that's what happens. And Anon is always a good example because this is a normal form. This is the simplest possible thing that has a quadratic component in, in the plane, but it's a mapping in two dimensions or a flow in three dimensions or higher. And already here, things are very hard. So we started with maps in one dimension to discuss chaos, you know, what happens to parabola and transitions to chaos, etc. And this has been a serious work of, you know, lots of very, very good topologists, mathematicians, physicists, et cetera. And one dimensional systems of that kind, we pretty much understand. We have a pretty good theory what happens on a line or a circle uh, is nonlinear dynamics. I don't think we expect deep surprises there. But what's really crazy and, you know, educational for you is that if you go to just one dimension more, which is described, for example, by a known map, we really don't know. You know, we don't have a complete classification of what behaviors of two-dimensional maps. We don't have proofs that many of them are ergodic or chaotic or, you know, or uh, not ergodic, not chaotic. So this is still widely open, and uh, it's serious, you know, it's close to what we see in nature, but mathematics of it's very serious. So what Smale actually did when he drew this picture, he did not discuss strange attractors he discussed something that's called repellers. Uh, and they turn out to be much cleaner, much easier to control from as the dynamical systems. And repellers, you know what they are. So in my chaos book, I use a very simple repeller as a recurrent theme through the whole book to teach you chaos. You know, I like to use physical systems rather than mathematical maps because, you know, you wonder why, what do you need to understand about a map that's interesting for a point of understanding some natural phenomenon. And the very intuitive system to understand ergodic systems is a pinball machine. Now, you know, I don't know whether you actually played pinball, but it used to be that there were pinball geniuses, there were pinball this and that. 
I went to a museum in South Carolina, which is the you know World Pinball Museum, where you can see these amazing machines. And what the pinballs tend to have is they tend to have something at the top of the machine when you eject your when you get ejected into the pinball, you hit three discs, and then you bounce around and you are ejected from them. You know that's a perfect humanly understandable example of system which is repelling. Everybody who goes in there has to leave because you would need an infinite precision or you'd be a really good pinball player if you could bounce the thing 20 times between two of the discs or something. Keep it there forever. You can do that because it's very unstable. But it's totally physical. So if you study meta in molecule and you want to know how it disassociates, and falls apart. It's example of that kind. It's a repeller. There are lots of good examples. So it's not uh, just mathematics. You need it. And here is another example that I'll finish with today, which is uh, also in Strogat. Let's look at driven harmonic oscillator and then you know sometimes we have damping but we don't need to have it and to make it do something interesting maybe we drive it by some external force typically periodic that's easiest of some strength so stuff we have been doing all along already but now Let's screw it up. Instead of having Hooke's law, let's make the linear term. You know, I push it, and instead of pushing back, it goes away from me. That's this minus sign. But it doesn't, cannot go away forever. It's a material. So it gets caught up. The next term, which turns out has to be cubic because of the symmetries of springs, you don't want them to distinguish left and right. And you can write this part, this is acceleration. So acceleration by Newton law is related to force, which is a gradient of potential. So you can write the potential like that. And you can worry about damping or not if you want, doesn't matter. But main thing is that you can go from oscillators to non-linear oscillators, and you encounter that all the time when you try to understand systems that are stretched beyond linear response. And you typically get something like this system. If you put here XQ term, that wins out. So it goes off to infinity when X increases. But in this particular system, the origin is unstable. If I go away from origin, my you know I get deeper into the well, and then the two bottoms of the well. So this is a kind of typical first nonlinear problem anybody should encounter. It's called you know quartic nonlinear oscillator because it has two bottoms, it's called double well. So this is the first physically sensible system that you encounter and you see it all over the place. So this could appear in quantum field theory, then it's called 5-4 theory. It appears all over the place. Now, if this term is not damping, you get that the determinant of any trajectory in two-dimensional phase space of the problem, you know, momentum and position is one. So if that happens, there is no attractor, right? Because uh, volumes are not shrinking, so you're not falling into anything.
But is there chaos? So what you do, this is extremely simple. Put on a computer, you run it. And pretty soon you start understanding some basic things about it. You know, so you can look at it in the momentum at time t. Well, it's a continuous function of time and position x of t. If you don't like Hamiltonian system, call it velocity, but you know, this is a second order equation. So you can, whenever you specify a point in this plane, it has unique future. And just do it. So one thing you'll notice, depending on the system, I don't want to be too specific, there might be some bounds saying that, you know, my system doesn't allow you to go someplace because there is a maximal energy. So there's some energy bound. But then uh, if you integrate this trajectory, you'll do whatever it's supposed to do for the oscillator. It'll go around and it'll go around and go around and go around and do this and this and uh, maybe hang around here and jump over there and uh, up. And uh, you'll find infinitely many papers with such pictures, which are not very useful. But basically what you'll discover is that the moment you take a mechanical system, which is not harmonic oscillator, the hell breaks loose. <laughs> Just uh, almost immediately things go bad. And then you will do the things that we taught you how to do. You'll say, well, you know, I can't, I don't understand what this stuff is. But let me stick a Poincaré section in this space. By the way, the, typically the systems that depend on X and Y also have uh, two coordinates. You know, here you don't make it two coordinates because you're making one of the coordinates trivially rotate. So it's really like a two coordinate system. But typically you have X and Y components. The more most interesting, first interesting cases, you have momentum in two directions. That means there's uh, two positions, two domains, it's four dimensional energy is conserved. So it's three dimensional. You cut it up and you get a Poincaré section, which is two dimensional. And you look at that Poincaré section carefully and you discover that it is fractal and has all this structure uh, that we saw in a known map, but it's a honest and mechanical system. It could be a double pendulum. If you ever go into person, into how a building, and there is or used to be a double pendulum in front of physics office uh, as an example of chaotic system which in principle should be doing this crazy stuff forever once you hit it, but it has friction from air mostly and it slows down. So that brings me to the end of Strange Attractors. And I'm only a few minutes over, not too criminal. Enjoy Thanksgiving and see you in a week. We, I can't believe it, but the whole thing is almost over. <laughs> but I'm glad, you know, I actually like Strogat's book more now, that I'm using it more now. It does cover the essential stuff. It gets you ready to start using chaos in your research. And uh, I will try to bake this Danish pastry. It'll be a disaster, but now I'm duty-bound to complete the project. <laughs>